Good morning from our global headquarters in New York. I'm Manis Cranny alongside Danny Berger. You're welcome to Bloomberg Brief. Let's set your agenda. Tech disappoints, Microsoft drops on a slower growth outlook, Meta warns on AI losses, Apple, Amazon, Intel all up next. Powered by the consumer, the U.S. expansion continues on, PCE and jobless claims, those are on deck. And we are just five days to go, counting down to the election with candidates in the final stretch of the swing state tours. Good morning, Manus. Well, we're in the swing. Good morning, Danny. We're in the swing state uh, of tech for sure. Uh, you got Meta and Microsoft both underwhelming. If you take yourself back 24 hours, and we'll talk about this in just a moment, Alphabet was a very different story. Here we are, down eight-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500, but the Nasdaq dragged lower uh, by over 1%. It seems to be a fixation with daily users and CapEx. AMD also tumbling. So much for the buybacks saving us at the moment. Uh, roll it over, have a look at the bonds. We were spooked yesterday uh, by the ADP numbers, by the strength of the economy. 233,000 in the ADP numbers. Yields just drop ever so slightly this morning. Jobless claims and PCE will define maybe the next leg of this bond market. At the moment, it does seem risk-off led by tech. How much of it, mm. though, Manis, just comes down to expectations and valuations? Yeah. Alphabet is the cheapest among the big cap tech names. Is that why we got a better response to them? Is this finally, everyone has been coming on this program warning us that valuations are too high. Is this how it shows up in earnings disappointments? I think if you take your mind back 24 hours ago, and we spent some time on this, which was it was an efficiency. The headlines were about efficiency within Alphabet. It was about driving AI. It was really that catch-up game for Alphabet relative yep. to their peers. Here we are with Microsoft and Meta, perhaps telling us, yes, we're going to up our game in terms of CapEx. But is there a lack of definition from Meta in terms of upping the guidance on CapEx? to what you get at the other side of the tube. I think that's a great point. It's about the starting point, right? And yes. Meta, Microsoft, they've already been showing up with some of their AI. So now it's show us the monetization, show us you can do more than just cost cuts. So we showed you there, Microsoft is extending its decline post earnings, forecasting a slower growth in cloud revenue. 3.7% is the decline this morning. Let's bring in Bloomberg Executive Editor for Global Tech, Peter Elstrom. Peter, what did you make of those Microsoft results? Well, you guys are making a very good point. These stocks have been priced so high at this point. The valuations are very, very high. And these companies are really shifting their business models quite substantially. Microsoft hit uh, record capital expenditures in this quarter. Their spending is up 50 percent from a year ago. And what people want to see from that is they want to see acceleration in their growth. So the revenues were actually not that bad. Revenue overall was up about 16 percent. The cloud computing revenue was up 40, uh, 34 percent. But they signaled that that's going to slow down in the quarters ahead. That's not what investors wanted to see. They want to see these AI investments really paying off at this point, helping with an acceleration in that revenue. So that was a little bit of a pessimistic note. And that's what you're really seeing with the stock price, I think, today. Yeah, well, I mean, even though AI is getting us to spend longer on Facebook and on Instagram, it, it, it's what happens next when you up that capex. Let's talk a little bit more about, about Meta. Uh, when you dig into this, daily average users, a little bit lighter than estimated. But I think the market is more focused on this capex number that they have upped and also the reality about reality labs. Uh, that's exactly right. Yeah, Mark Zuckerberg has been making these huge investments in technologies that he thinks uh, are going to help the company in the future. It, referring to the metaverse uh, a few years ago, he was uh, completely decided that that was going to be the big bet for the company. We're seeing that with Reality Labs, big losses uh, in, that, in that business. Uh, and now also they're spending a lot of money on AI, like these other companies we've been talking about, Microsoft and Alphabet, too. These expenditures are very uh, pricey for the companies. They're hitting uh, spending levels that they have never done really in the past, partly because the NVIDIA chips are expensive. They're trying to build out data centers. These are things these companies just didn't have to do in the past because they were capital light businesses. And now Meta is determined to make these investments and hopefully, hopefully benefit from it in the future. Peter, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to talk about all of the plethora of tech because we get more today, Apple, Intel, Amazon. What do you think in there is going to be the most interesting? Well, there are big questions for all of the companies that you mentioned. I'd say for Al uh, Apple in particular, they've been trying to sell Apple intelligence. They want it to be their version of AI. They hope that that helps uh, convince con customers that it's time to buy a new iPhone. They want to sell these uh, the new iPhone 16 in particular. For Intel, they just have to get back on a solid financial footing. They've had so many problems so far. Uh, uh, investors are concerned about their foundry business in particular, but also their ability to compete in processors and in AI in particular. So they want to see that there's some uh, solid financial foundation underneath the company at this point so that they can 
get back to growing, get back to expanding. It really is the, the most important chip maker for the U.S. government as they're trying to build up this domestic capability that's so important strategically in the future. Well, right now, the terrible M's are dragging us down, aren't they? Microsoft down 3.7 and Meta down 4 and an eighth. Peter, thank you very much. Context uh, setting thank the you. stage there on the tech front. Uh, on the macro data front, well, we've got a host coming across the board today. Personal income and spending, core PC, jobless claims, they're all on deck after the latest readings show robust growth thanks to the resilience of the consumer. Nuveen's Laura Cooper says this, uh, stay vigilant amid solid numbers, writing a mix of reflation, positioning, US growth exceptionalism, fears of fiscal accommodation and a shallower cutting path have underpinned the bond route that we're in. Heightened uncertainty heading into the US election keeps us cautious. So we've got something for everybody there, haven't we, Laura, in terms of why these bond yields are flexing as aggressively higher as they are. Danny and I have debated red sweep, uh, presidency of Trump, etc. When you look at the pricing of this market, do you think the bonds at 430 on the 10 year are already fully priced for a Trump presidency or indeed a red sweep? Well, I think it's hard to say whether the backup and yields that we have seen can be fully attributed just to that Trump sweep. And I think that's largely because this has come at the same time where we've seen U.S. growth exceptionalism extend. We certainly saw that in the GDP, GDP print yesterday with the strength of the consumer spending. So to your question, while we do think that th at these levels, you know, it's quite attractive, but we're not yet extending duration because there is a risk that that, that Republican sweep is not yet fully priced. Yields could extend higher. And that's actually one of the key risks, I think, to our year-end target of 4% for the U.S. 10-year. With all of that backup in yields that's been happening, Laura, something different happened yesterday. We had good news that meant yields went higher. You mentioned personal consumption, the GDP figures, ADP, and stocks sold off. Are we back to the regime where higher yields are <laughs> affecting equities, where good news is bad news for risk? Well, I think actually what's been interesting about the equity market rally that we've seen certainly over the past several weeks is the fact that, you know, this is a market that's been resilient despite the backup in yields. So some of that, that pullback was actually long anticipated. And I think really what we're looking at now is a market that's focused on U.S. election uncertainty. The potential fear of resumption in inflation is another key risk. And as we're seeing this morning, just those mixed tech earnings. So there's a confluence of factors, I think. And so from a positioning perspective, we are still taking a fairly defensive tilt in U.S. equities. We like dividend growing companies in particular, and we are kind of leaning still into the tech space because of the profitability metrics, despite some, some of the mixed earnings that reports that are coming through. If you're nervous about taking duration, when you look at the auctions that we had this week, it was tough to get the twos and fives away. I think that's just because of the angst that we have. But the sevens were the strongest bid to cover ratio on record. Yeah, and it's a great point. I mean, I think demand is still there for, for pockets of the curve, predominantly the belly, like you mentioned. And if we look at what our view is, I mean, we do still think, you know, the front end to the belly of the curve is going to be fairly well anchored because regardless of the election outcome, this is still going to be a Fed that is largely data dependent. The front end is most sensitive to that. So if we start to see, you know, data come in, still continuing to be quite strong in the U.S., we could start to see some of those further rate easing priced out. So so I think at this point, you know, the two year really looks quite attractive in our view, whereas in the duration positioning, as I mentioned, you know, inflation concerns, fiscal deficit fears. I think we're just still still taking a cautious stance uh, to that to that degree of the curve now. How does the Fed continue to be data dependent, though, Laura, when the data is about to be so strange? I was just looking at the survey for where jobs will be tomorrow. 101 K is the median estimate, the lowest is a negative 10,000 by Bloomberg Intelligence. The highest comes from Steve Rusciuto of Mizuho, which is 180,000. Laura, how do we even begin to wrap our heads around the kind of number we're going to be getting tomorrow? Well, I think it's largely anticipated that tomorrow's print is probably going to be more noise than signal. And if actually we look back to previous weather events, like in 2017, we had a trio of hurricanes. And in that context, Janet Yellen actually extended the Fed pause, but she noted that there's unlikely to be a material impact from the weather events over the economic growth over the medium term. So I suspect Fair, Chow, Fair Chair Powell is going to take a very similar stance in the sense that, look, this is probably going to be a 
transitory hit. We're likely going to see jobs rebound over the coming kind of few months. But I think importantly, taking a step back, this is a jobs market that we do still think is kind of easing slowly. And that's largely because, you know, job openings yesterday did suggest that openings are falling, quit rates are falling. There, so there is this kind of degree of labor market slack that is building. And that underpins our view that the Fed is still going to cut policy rates by 25 basis points at the next consecutive few meetings, all the way until June, when we get to that about 3.5% terminal rate. Laura, thanks for setting it up for us. Always a pleasure to speak with you. Laura Cooper there of Nuveen. Man, let's get some of the other top stories trending on the terminal this morning. BNP Paribas posted third quarter results that got a trading boost. Performance of its stocks and fixed income business were strong, but its lending business, that continues to struggle. The French bank confirmed its targets for the full year, including a pledge to raise profit to more than 11.2 billion euros. Siemens has agreed to buy the software maker Altair Engineering for $10 billion. Furthering the German engineering giant's migration to higher margin software-driven product lines. The transaction, expected to close in the second half of next year, provides a 19% premium for Altair shareholders. Sockgen beat analyst estimates as investment bankers saw a 10% increase in equity trading, a 6% increase for fixed income. The results may provide a boost for the CEO, who has struggled for more than a year to win over investors with a strategy focused on capital strength. Coming up. Former President Trump adds another title to his resume, garbage truck driver. How the candidate is using Biden's comments to pick up momentum. And we're going to get more on election risk. We're going to catch up with Mark McCormick of TD Securities later this hour. Stick for that conversation on why the difference between Trump and Harris is one of market focus versus data focus. This is Bloomberg. I pledge to seek common ground and common sense solutions to the challenges you face. I am not looking to score political points. I am looking to make progress. They treat you like garbage. They treat our whole country like garbage with open borders, with all of the horrible things they've done to hurt our country, inflation that should have never happened allowing Russia to go into Ukraine October 7th in Israel. All of these things would have never happened if you had a different president. That was Vice President Harris and former President Trump making their final pitchers to vote, pitch to voters only five days to go until the election. Former President Trump, you could see him there in the high-vis jacket using Biden's controversial garbage remark to his advantage by driving a garbage truck that carried his name in a vest. Joining us now is Bloomberg government's Courtney Rosen. Courtney, we should just clarify the comments that Biden made, basically saying the only thing is that's garbage, referring to the whole joke about Puerto Rico that, let's be honest, was a very crude joke. The only thing that's garbage are Trump supporters. Biden team comes out and says, no, 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 there's supposed to be an apostrophe on the S. He was talking about that one specific joke. Courtney, what does it just say at this point that we are down to the wire and you have someone like President Biden still coming out and giving gaffes? How did the candidates navigate these last couple of days? The next couple of days, President Biden is going to be out there, but I'd expect him to be more scripted and more um, restrained, for lack of a better way to describe it. Uh, we're not expecting to see him today um, at the White House or out in public. Uh, Vice President Harris has tried to distance herself from those comments. President Trump, as you saw, making them, you know, a media spectacle and a visual with that garbage truck. So um, I'd see in the next couple of days this will s continue to play out, but also we're not going to see the president as much. Was well, the potency of the news cycle, and you, you got to say that, that they win at that. And um, the one thing that we are perhaps most focused on is the risk of legal challenges, contested election. Look at what happened in, in Virginia. You've got a purging of the voter polls. But in Pennsylvania, uh, again, there's been another legal challenge there. Run us through what that is and what it means for early voting, because their early voting is, is very different to everybody else's uh, around the country, isn't it? Yes. So early voting in Pennsylvania um, is not an option. People can mail in their ballot or they can go pick up a ballot to mail in, but it's not like they can go wait in the line, pass a ballot and be done. Uh, in Pennsylvania, the Trump campaign had accused 
uh, election officials of not allowing people to pick up a request form for a ballot. Uh, now in the state, they're going to extend the mail-in ballot um, for an extra day as a result of that. I should say that across the country, mail-in ballots, early voting is extremely popular. When I checked uh, the Associated Press this morning, they're at 58 million ballots already cast, um, and we haven't even hit election day yet. So these are high stakes. Uh, these early ballots, which is why you're going to see both campaigns focus on them heavily from a litigation perspective. It's also been fascinating to see, Courtney, that the mail-in ballots that usually skew Democrat, they still are doing that, but more Republicans voting early, too. How does that change the schedule from here? We know they're highly concentrated on the swing states. What's the message? What's the travel schedule like? Vice President Harris is focused on hammering President Trump as chaotic, as divisive, and painting herself as stability and a solution to that. She's going to hit all seven swing states in the next couple of days. Um, and in addition to that message, the message is uh, go vote, right? If there's a choice between staying home and voting, she's trying to get people to go to the polls. Um, we're going to see her in the next couple of days out at rallies, out with celebrities, trying to really um, gin up enthusiasm. Now, uh, former President Trump, he's also focused on encouraging people to vote early and just to do that as opposed to staying home, right? Um, his message has been a lot more muddled in the final days, but it has focused on when you put together the themes of the Biden-Harris administration has not been positive for voters and that he would bring complete change um, to the way the U.S. government runs should he be elected. Okay, well, it's certainly uh, it's going to be interesting to see how it, pro how it plays out with that early voting. I'm just looking at the New York Times, 54 million in North Carolina uh, leads the pace in terms of early voting. Courtney, thank you very much. Courtney Rosen there of Bloomberg Government. Uh, Dolly Yen is moving. We were checking this when we came in this morning. We've uh, had the comments from Governor Ueda. It's on track. Uh, look at that, Danny. You've got uh, the dollar index. I mean, it is pacing ahead over the month. But Dolly Yen, this is dollar down, yen rising Ueda. FX may have a major impact on the economy and prices, and he wants to judge the impact of a weak yen. So it's the rhetoric about probably reticence uh, of where we are in this stage. Yeah, and let's just take a listen to that. We do not have preconceived ideas on the timing of the rate hike. Instead, the board will examine data available to us at each meeting and update our view on the economy and outlook in making our policy decision. You had to time himself to the currency, and this I find really interesting. Uh, Standard Charter says 160 is the level that would force their hand to hike. But you know what causes that? It's a Trump victory. It is a stronger dollar off the back of that, which could, conversely, charge the, charge the BOJ to hike. It just shows some of the reticence to do any moves now, because it's not just internal politics in Japan, no. which is playing out here, but it's American politics, too. And if you think about it, you know, we're going to have this conversation with Mark McCormick it, it, very, very shortly. What is it that has actually moved the dollar so far? It's about what has moved rates so far? It's no landing. What has moved the dollar so far? And we'll dig into this with Mark McCormick. It's about U.S. assets, the valuation of equities, and you don't want to kill yeah. the golden goose. So it's not just politics that's driving the dollar. Yeah. It's the alpha of American assets. Right. Um, something's going, some, they're going somewhere into American assets. Maybe not bonds recently, yeah. but, you know, stocks. Speaking of which. There's a few others. One stock that is in our focus. We're going to talk about Manus's coffee habits in the morning, Manus, and how long it takes him to order his double shot caramel macchiato with a twist, whatever. He Starbucks <laughs> combinations. <laughs> We're going to dive into their new vision from the new CEO next. Pages from around the world look a little bit like this this Thursday morning. Let's kick it off with the New York Times. Danny is emotional about this. The LA <laughs> I'm glad you're reading this, that's all I'm saying. The LA, <laughs> I was specifically told to read this. She can't, add, she can't take any more of it. The LA Dodgers defeated the Yankees. I've no skin in this game. Defeated the Yankees to win their eighth World Series. Los Angeles came back from a five-run deficit to defeat New York. 
It's the second World Series title for the Dodgers in just five years. I read that slowly. I think I'm going to just move on from this and not, not give any comments. Now, you're right. Yeah. Rise above it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Manis. Let's talk about China. Bloomberg has this. China's economy picking up on a stimulus push ahead of the U.S. election. Factory activity unexpectedly expanded in October, and they may be able to achieve their 5% target. And let's round it off. Wall Street Journal leads with Starbucks pledging to keep the prices steady. Customers have been complaining about high prices and long waits. The chain ads had three quarters of declining same source sales. But Danny has a fact of the day I do. on Starbucks. Well, part fact of what of he day. wants to do is to trim back the kind of options you can have on just a latte alone, Manis. Combinations? Just a latte. 383 billion with it be possible combinations for ordering a latte at Starbucks. The upside is this, you're going to be able to choose your own milk, your own sugar, Ooh. and they're getting rid of those olive drinks. Oh, I never tried them. 300, how many? 383 billion. There's a figure. From our global headquarters in New York, welcome to Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger, alongside Manis Cranny. Let's set your agenda. Tech disappoints. Microsoft drops on a slower growth outlook. Meta warns on AI losses. Apple, Amazon, Intel, all up next. Powered by the consumer, the US expansion continues. PC and jobless claims on deck today. And we have five days to go, counting down to the US election with candidates in their final stretch of the swing state tours. It's a 3.5% drop for Meta pre-market. It's a 3.5% drop for Microsoft pre-market. That is why you're seeing the indexes fare so poorly today. It is the NASDAQ 100 futures leading us lower, down 1%. We also sold off yesterday in part due to the pressure of higher yields. It was strong data across the board in Europe, in the U.S. In Europe, we're questioning 50 basis points. We had an ADP survey that was strong, strong growth. Tens went above 4.3% for the first time since July. This morning, Manus, they are back below that, 4.29%, just barely. Today is a big day, too. PCE inflation, Apple and Amazon after the bell. And yet, when you look at that bond board, you know, the, it's about disaggregating. What is it that's moved us to 4.3? Is it all the no landing, all the good data? Look at the reaction function, the ADP numbers, and you begin to say it's the data that's driving the yields. Mm. Well, what happens next if you do get a... Trump presidency or even a red sweep. What is the musculature of those yields? Can they get, can they break 4.5? The options market is pricing in 4.5, which is only another 20 basis points. That is nothing on a red sweep. It also begs the question, if it is a Harris victory, how much of it is even given back? If this is all due to economic strength, maybe we still are looking at 4.3% yields even in under a Harris win. And maybe that, that, that's, the asset, that's the asset differential. Maybe it is the equity market that has the drawdown. It's the bond market which remains priced evenly at the money for no landing. I have to say, in, in sort of understanding the market reaction difference to Harris versus Trump, one yeah. of the smartest things I've read comes from Mark McCormick of TD Bank. This is what he writes. Quote, while a Trump is bullish for the dollar in the short term, a Harris victory doesn't spell doom for the U.S. dollar. Indeed, inflation and growth drive the market rather than Harris, while Trump resets the market towards politics. Please to say that Mark joins us now. He's the global head of FX and EM strategy at TD Bank. Mark, I just love that as a setup, that the data is what drives market under Harris, and it is politics that drives markets under Trump. So how do you set up for that outcome? Well, I think a piece of it is uh, everything that happens uh, in terms of event risk we, is always about positioning. Like this week, you know, obviously in FX, like it's not, uh, you have to focus on its month end. So the dollar's had a really strong rally. U.S. assets about perform. So the dollar, I think, is largely selling off as a function of month, of month end. And also, if you look at our positioning indicators, what we've seen is the market's kind of gravitated quite aggressively in a very short term period uh, towards buying the dollar. I think so we need to unpack like what would happen on the event, on liquidity, and what can happen in the months after. And, and I think the underlying piece of that story is, again, that we've been kind of hammering home that U.S. fundamentals are much better than Europe and Asia. We know that the market's getting Chinese stimulus. But again, the market can't focus on more than multiple themes at a time. So I think what's, what's most important is the U.S. has a higher terminal rate. Uh, the market's repriced a higher terminal rate. U.S. data, you know, in a world of data dependence, is better than most other places around the world. And the market's recognizing that. And I think, uh, you know, regardless of who wins, Harris or Trump, again, we will have a positioned event and we will have to pay potentially unwind Trump hedges if Harris wins. But that does not set the landscape for what can happen in the aftermath. 
Well, let's just break down some of the events, Mark. Good to see you this morning. Looking at G10 over the past month, all currencies are lower against the dollar in G10. And the worst performing is, of course, the yen. When you break it down, I, and again, we asked you the same question we asked the, the bond gas a little bit earlier. You would say the dollar's drive higher is on the valuation of dollar assets rather than politics. So if you do get a red sweep and or a Trump presidency and a split Congress, is there much more flex in the dollar from here? Can it be a much more vicious leg higher on that construct? Absolutely. I, I think... We're not seeing like really, I would say, a lot of Trump trades. I'd say market positioning's moved in the favor of the dollar, largely as a function of a couple of things working together. Again, while we, we're kind of hammering home the idea through the summer that U.S. data is better, uh, so that's a good thing. We've we've been hammering home the idea that we need more macro volatility. That's we're seeing that happen as well. And again, at the same time, we just said the market, as much as we've all spent this entire year talking about this election, no one was actually trading it. Um, so we've moved on from the focus on the U.S. data was slowing and we had to reprice the Fed. That theme has been absolutely disrupted by the data. But now the market is actually looking at good U.S. data in conjunction with what is, what is be, uh, you know, polls and betting markets and the data that we can all track on the election, that it's moving more in favor of Trump. So just at the very least, you have to think about you have to price in the risk reward of terrorist potential, of uncertainty of a potential shift on the Fed, because what everything Trump proposes, especially for a red wave, is inflationary. And inflation is another thing that's been catching the market off guard is for the whole year, we've been focused on different themes. And I feel like what the market's moving back towards, this is why we're seeing the bear steepening U.S. curve, is inflation is not dead. We are dealing with inflation that's sitting above most central banks' targets. And most of the world has easy monetary policy and easy fiscal policy. So again, the red sweep to me is absolutely not priced in whatsoever. You can see the dollar move another three, four percent higher across the board because the market's going to have to reconsider how much the Fed can move and also how the whole world would essentially kind of operate um, in a new uncertain environment. Mark, what do you then make of calls like that from Adam Posen of the Peterson Institute, that if there is a Trump presidency, a red sweep, not only does inflation remain sticky, but it's an environment where we're going to start talking about hikes again in 2025? Absolutely. If you just go through the kind of the context of 2024, it was tons of Fed cuts priced in, Fed cuts priced out. We did talk about hikes for, you know, a couple of weeks uh, earlier in the year, and then that was kind of reversed again, and we got back to cuts and now we're basically pulling the cuts out. I think it's it's very interesting in the context of, of stuff that we talked about in our research. We run these portfolios, we run these factors to help us understand what's going on in the FX market. And the story that we've been saying all year is mean reversion is king. Macro factors like growth and inflation are not working um, as trading strategies and effects because we don't know exactly what data dependence means. We know that a month of data or two months of data on negative growth surprises gets us focused on cuts. But now we're starting to see inflation indicators start to creep up. We're seeing higher inflation surprises, which pushes us back towards inflation. So I think that's absolutely right. But if you could look at every country around the world, Japan is a perfect example. Japan is still going to pursue further fiscal stimulus, um, which is going to force the BOJ to hike more. You can see in Britain's budget, it's more fiscal spending. You can see it across the board that you know half the world has gone to vote this year. And the outcome is politicians are looking for ways to boost fiscal stimulus. We have not left aggressive mon uh, monetary and fiscal stimulus policies since the pandemic. They're all both basically coordinated at this point. So I would absolutely agree that the thing we should be worried about is not downside to growth, it's upside to inflation. And that upside to inflation is something that could have a real impact on the Fed here in 2025. We've had Torsten Slob talking about the potential for no cuts and maybe even a reversal for the Fed going into 2025. But I want to go back to your comment on the complacency about macro volatility. Look at credit spreads, tight as can be, all-time highs just often in, in the equity markets. Bond vol, Danny was touching on this yesterday, is rising. So what is, where are we most complacent or what are you most concerned about? I would say macro vol is kind of a composite of the VIX, global FX volatility, and something like the move. That's a, that's an indicator that we run as a composite. Uh, we compare that to geopolitical uncertainty. We compare that to uh, a risk premium that we use that looks at cross assets. So I, I would say it's that. And I, I'd say it's that because that's an indicator that we look at for the carry trade. 
Um, and I think one of the big stories of 2024, and I think this is going to carry over to 2025, is whether or not the, the best performing strategy that's usually in everyone's toolbox for FX, which is carry, whether or not that's a viable strategy uh, for next year. It's, it's something that we pushed against, again, which is why we're bullish the yen. Uh, which is also why I think, you know, this could be another conversation, maybe action election, but regardless of who wins, you could actually potentially think of a bullish environment for Asia assets, even if Trump uh, wins and tries to push a, a tariff agenda. The one thing that I would highlight here is that, you know, the higher macro vol that we kind of keep seeing, either as a function of geopolitical or data or markets repricing central banks, it continues to undermine carry because what we're seeing is rate differentials are compressing and we're getting hit by higher volatility. Um, and that's cr continuing to see a strategy that's fundamentally not that sophisticated. Uh, carries basically you buy assets with higher yielding uh, yields and then hope that volatility doesn't rise. Uh, I think, you know, what we're seeing here is a rotation out of that. And we'll continue to see that into 2025. OK, there's a huge amount of uncertainty between between over the next five days and indeed beyond that, as you say, the dollar uh, can continue to rally. Mark, thank you very much. Mark McCormick, TD Bank. Uh, let's just check out on the bond markets. We had uh, a massive uh, budget yesterday in the United Kingdom. Uh, Danny, what you hear is another spike in the very short end of the curve. Figures from the debt management office show that debt sales were likely to reach 300 billion pounds in the current fiscal quarter. So that's up from 278. So the short end and indeed across the curve spiking. A market that's willing to punish the UK. Will it be willing to pu punish the US mm. in a similar fashion? This is Bloomberg. Brief. I'm Anish Manny alongside Danny Boga in New York. The Mag 7, you're waking up this morning to a very different market. Microsoft and Meta earnings after the strong results from Alphabet 24 hours earlier. Let's discuss the differential of 24 hours with Richard Claude, portfolio manager at Janice Henderson. Good to have you with us. Here we go. 24 hours ago, we were flexing on fire. Alphabet was delivering AI, productivity gains, uh, usage coding this morning we are so much more restrained on microsoft and meta what is the differential here is it the starting point of alphabet or the underwhelming uh, numbers perhaps in in some areas from meta and microsoft yeah, exactly. I think near term, it's just expectations and positioning relatively within the MAG 7, which is why I don't you can ever look at them as, as a monolith. But if actually, if you take a step back, I think actually there's just a lot of commonality between many of those businesses that you know, very large scale platforms are delivering 15 to 20 percent organic growth with expanding margins and even with massive capex still generating a lot of free cash flow and shareholder return. So, you know, starting to see those returns on that AI capex. But, you know, that debate's just not going to go away anytime soon. The margins, though, do seem as, as a sticking point, Richard, because for now, Microsoft and Meta showed yesterday that part of what they're able to squeeze out are, are cost cuts. I know the FT had reported that Meta was restructuring certain teams with that sort of aim. How long can they continue to do that, to preserve m margins by cost cuts versus more monetization of the AI products they're putting out? It was a bit of both, isn't it? You're, you're trying to monetize products externally, but then you're also leveraging this AI technology internally. So, you know, as we heard from Google, you know, 25% of coding is now done by Gen AI. Um, you know, we've seen that at Microsoft, we're seeing that at Meta, you know, the ad generation, 15 million uh, Gen AI ads, and, and they're seeing better um, you know, uh, uh, throughput and, and, and click-through rates on those as well. So you're seeing both. I think the internally they're using this technology and externally. And so you can optimize your business in terms of headcount because you are seeing those productivity gains from this new technology. When it comes to Microsoft, perhaps one of the more alarming things was from the CFO. She talked about a limited capacity, limiting their capacity and their ability to deliver. They are constrained by their data center build out. Now, the risk to the market is, is that they run headlong into more and more capex to deliver on that. How much of a restraint or how much of a holdback will that narrative be from the CFO? 
Well, that's what the market's got to decide. It. Which one is it? Are we worried that they're supply constrained or are we worried they're going to spend too much on, on CapEx? And I think th this tension in the market just isn't going to go away. And there's always just a timing issue. You know, the CapEx spend comes first, you train up that large language model, you create some new product or service, and then you go to market and you're going to monetize it. And there's just going to be, in some cases, years between the two. And so the market's just got to keep comfortable that the spending is in proportion to the opportunity in the future. And that's why all these companies are now giving us a lot of these milestones to make us feel comfortable that they're seeing the benefits internally and then also ramping up these businesses. So Microsoft also said, you know, they've hit $10 billion of AI sales and that's the fastest that they've ever got to $10 billion in a new product or a new technology. Richard, I love this idea that the companies are kind of hand-holding us saying, okay, we're getting there, we're going to get to these different AI milestones, it's okay, you're going to be alright on the journey. How successful do you think Apple has been at that? We're going to get their earnings today, they've released some of their Apple intelligence features, have they held our hands and are we going to be okay? Yeah, so that's another one where I think it's going to be a journey. I think, you know, we've only just started to see some of those Apple intelligence features come through in, into iOS. And, you know, that's only in U.S. English. That's only in certain geographies. So, you know, I was never a believer that this was going to drive a major replacement cycle in this iPhone cycle. But I think we're rapidly going to move forward into thinking about, you know, what's going to happen next year and beyond that. And their vision of, you know, that Siri is your gateway into Gen AI is a very interesting proposition to keep their fundamental positioning and competitive moat in a Gen AI world. But we've got to see how that's going to play out because Meta's telling you actually no we, we want you know meta's apps to be your way to engage with ai agents and we don't want to be disintermediated by siri or by apple and, and again that tension as to who's going to own the top of the funnel into a gen ai world is going to determine ultimately who's going to be the most successful in this business well when you look through the, the narrative it was about ai productivity gains in alphabet it's about spending a little bit more time on Facebook and Instagram and generating adverts. So if we cast forward then to Amazon today, what is it that you're gonna be looking for from an AI perspective from Amazon? So we've always seen the cloud platforms as a delivery mechanism for this new technology. I think all companies are coming to terms with actually only 20% of workloads are in the cloud. And, and why didn't they shift? Well, they didn't shift because it, it takes time, it's costly, it's painful. But then Gen AI and, and sort of trying to create the strategy for, for where you see your company in the future, that data architecture now has to move to the cloud. You're going to be leveraging AI uh, large language models and services from these companies. So that cloud platform growth, we're seeing accelerate across the board. And we'd like to see that from Amazon too. You've seen that from GCP. You've seen that from Azure, we'd expect to see that from Amazon as well. And then we'd like to see them be a bit more front foot. You know, they've got the capabilities, they've been designing the silicon for years, but they've just been a little bit back foot in terms of positioning and probably lost a little bit of mind share to the Azures and open eyes, eyes of this world. We'd like to see them get a lot more front foot. And I think that's why you've seen some of the management changes that you have at the company. Richard, one of the things that I'm, I'm getting from you, especially with this idea of Meta saying, we don't want you using Siri, we want you to use our own agent, are these companies treating AI and the future of generative AI as a zero-sum game, almost a prisoner's dilemma of who can outspend who, who kind of blinks first and goes full on in. Is this how it's going to be? Is it a winner takes maybe not all but most future for AI? Well, I think on, on the one hand, you're seeing that no one wants to get off the train because the risk of underinvesting is, is certainly much greater than, than overinvesting. So that, that's a, a risk. But I think the thing we all miss with these new technologies is that the addressable markets end up being much bigger. So, you know, rewind a year or 18 months and everyone was worried about Google search and it being disintermediated. We're going to add more Google search dollars this year than we have done in, you know, in any of the prior five years because actually contextual search is actually greater utility to us. And so we're doing more searches. And so they've got a, a billion AI overviews and they're monetizing just as well as a traditional search. And so I think we're going to see that, that these markets will end up being a lot bigger. We've already seen that with NVIDIA, that actually your data center business can be you know, multiple times what we saw in the cloud world for an Intel. I think we'll see that at a lot of new markets. They're just going end up being a lot bigger and so it's not going to be a zero-sum game because the, the game just got a hell of a lot bigger. It's a bigger pie. Richard, wonderful to have you on. Thanks so much for joining us. Richard Claude of Janice Henderson. Okay, more earnings on deck this morning. ConocoPhillips, they are set to report before the market open. Then we're going to get Chevron and Exxon tomorrow. It is the big oil come to play. James Heron joins us now. James, set the scene for us. What are we expecting? Uh, well, it's going to be a weaker quarter overall just because the, the backdrop of oil markets it was down very much in the third quarter, both crude prices and margins on refining fuel. Uh, I think the key to look for really is, is resilience in two ways. It's, it's balance sheet resilience, like to what extent can the companies maintain their buybacks, dividends, these really generous investor returns they've been having for the last few years. Um, so look for signs of you know rising debt, putting pressure on it. We've seen that a bit in the European 
companies so far, and also resilience in terms of like um, natural gas has been a big thing. Um, it's the gas markets have been doing a bit better um, than oil markets, and the companies that have bigger gas businesses have again in the Europe proved to be a bit more resilient to the the weaker overall energy markets. So I think that's the the things to look out for when we see Conoco and today and then Exxon and Chevron tomorrow. James, good to see you this morning. We've had Shell and Total this morning. I look at the Shell numbers. Again, really impressive on the buyback, $3.5 billion over the next three months. I look, at, I look at Total a little bit lighter. How important is the buyback in this narrative in the European market relative to, let's say, deregulation here in the United States, which is a political issue? Uh, it's very important. Um, you know, investors have doubts about the, the long-term viability of oil companies and their growth potential, particularly because of you know, climate change and net zero. Um, so the buybacks have been a major way of wooing investors. And, but obviously, in, as we now move into a period of lower energy prices, can companies, do they have the balance sheet strength to maintain these buybacks? Now, we saw on Tuesday BP, its net debt rose a bit in the third quarter. And it raised the possibility that it's going to review its buyback policy in February and, you know, it, it might change. A lot of analysts predict that it will be a lower buyback. And then their shares fell 5% on the day of earnings. Whereas Shell came out today, it's stuck to its buyback plan. Its, net, its gearing actually dropped again this quarter, even though the oil prices were weaker. And it's saying that its balance sheet is strong enough where it can really just withstand a weaker macroeconomic picture and, and, but maintain investor returns. And I, I think that's, that's key, really. OK, James, thank you very much. Uh, filling us in there on the very latest from the oil market. Coming up, Daniel, I'll set you up for the rest of your trading day. We've got uh, a nice clip of economic data and, of course, a few more earnings to run through. This is Bloomberg. It's your Bloomberg Brief on this Thursday. Danny Berger and Manish Cranny in New York. Let's get you set up for your trading day. Earnings are going to come. ConocoPhillips, Uber, MasterCard, all those report before the bell. We're also going to get core PCE, personal income and spending and jobless claims, 8.30 a.m. Eastern for that. And Manish, we're going to get more big tech, Apple, Amazon, Intel. Those all come after the market close. We're going to be drenched with macro and micro. Let me take you through a couple of moves here. Uh, you've got uh, micro strategy uh, moving towards raising $42 billion for Bitcoin. Uh, booking holdings, third quarter, gross, gross bookings there, beat estimates, and they raised their forecast. But brutal day out for Roku uh, on the streaming service. Forecast a miss for the estimates, and they're going to stop reporting quarterly user numbers. Uh, and that is a brutal drop, down 14%. Danny. Speaking of tough drops, both Meta and Microsoft falling in the pre-market session. Is this investors finally antsy about high valuations? If you point to one difference between them and Google, it is that Google is coming from a much cheaper place. So maybe the bar mm. is just different for these companies. I think the narrative that Alphabet managed to sell to the market yesterday very, very clearly, which was about the productivity gains from the AI. I mean, there's a number of lovely one-liners. The constraint that Microsoft has said that they have in terms of their data centers is probably one of the biggest concerns. You'll get more tech in surveillance. We'll be back tomorrow.